Hi, my name is Lynn Stanley and I'm the Curator of Education at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Freddie Schiff Levin event, the first of the season, a panel discussion with co-curators Ethan Cohen and Jane Paradise, artist Ray Elman, and Executive Director Christine McCarthy, in conjunction with the exhibition Elman and Holt, The Outer Cape Art Colony, on view at PAM through August 7, 2016. This lecture series was begun in 2003 in honor of the artist Freddie Schiff Levin, who was a member of Provincetown's arts community from the 1960s until her passing in 2002. Pam gratefully acknowledges John and Tony Levin, who make this program possible with their generous support. We'd also like to thank Provincetown Community Television for their support of this lecture series and Liz Lavati of Angel Foods for her continued support. The photographer Norma Holt was born in 1918 and died in 2013. She was passionately committed to photo documentation as a way of life and a means to initiate social change. Her work took her from the streets of New York City to the anti-war protests of the Vietnam era to villages of the working poor across the globe. For over five decades, Holt summered in Provincetown. She treasured the egalitarian nature of the town where celebrated artists and writers mix easily with locals and developing artists. Two books of portraiture resulted from her time on the Cape. Face of the Artist and On Equal Ground, photographs from an artist community at the tip of Cape Cod. We actually have this book for sale on equal ground in the bookstore, so I encourage you to pick one up tonight. Raymond Elman arrived in Provincetown in 1970. He made abstract art until 1989 when he invented a technique for making large-scale portraits to document his wife Lee's pregnancy and the birth of their son Evan. Elman then shifted focus to documenting his life in the art community by making part portraits of many talented artists and writers he knew who embraced the Outer Cape. Since 1989, Elman has made more than 220 portraits, including those of Norman Mailer, Robert Motherwell, Stanley Kunitz, Alan Dugan, Annie Dillard, Mark Strand, Sebastian Younger, Alec Wilkinson, Varujan Bogosian, Bud Hopkins, Misha Richter, Al Jaffe, Lee Falk, Anne Bernays, Susan Orlean, Jhumpa Lahiri, Robert Pinsky, and Knox Martin. That's quite an impressive list. Four of Elman's pieces are in the collection of the Smithsonian National Portrait Gallery. He has served as a trustee officer of the Provincetown Art Association and Museum, as president of the Provincetown Group Gallery, as board member of the Wellfleet Harbor Actors Theater, and as co-founder, publisher, editor of Provincetown Arts Magazine. Jane Paradise is a Provincetown, Massachusetts photographic artist and is represented by the Galatea Fine Art Gallery in Boston. Her photographs have been featured and exhibited in solo and group shows throughout the U.S. and abroad, including the Griffin Museum of Photography, Art Space in Raleigh, North Carolina, Gallery Eva in Provincetown, Simmons College, the Houston Center for Photography, the International Biennial of Fine Art and Documentary Photography in Argentina and Spain, and the Gallery of Photography in Ireland. Her photographs are in public and private collections in the U.S. and Europe. She is a trustee of the Provincetown Art Association and Museum and former deputy director of the International Museum of Women. As well as co-curating this exhibition, she curated After Images by Amy Arbus at PAM in 2015. Paradise is working on an, an October 2016 group show in Berlin, Germany, and on a solo show in March 2017 at the Galatea Fine Art Gallery, focusing on the dune shacks of Provincetown. Paradise's photographs are published in the book Strength and Grace, Elegy for Love, Many of the photographs in that book are of Norma Holt. And we also have this book, which is a beautiful book on sale in the museum store. Ethan 
Cohen is an American collector and an art dealer based in New York City who specializes in contemporary Chinese and contemporary African art. He was one of the first Western dealers to sell work by contemporary Japanese and Chinese artists, including Ushio Shinohara and Ai Weiwei. He has been called one of the most influential art dealers in the world. Forbes praised his gallery as an exemplar in the field and uh, putting on resplendent probing shows. Ethan Cohen Gallery was founded in 1987 as Art Waves Ethan Cohen in Soho, New York City. It was the first gallery to present Chinese avant-garde of the, the Chinese avant-garde of the 1980s to the United States. Ethan Cohen Fine Arts today represents a diverse global mix of art, including contemporary American, African, Iranian, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Russian, Pakistani, and Thai from emerging and established artists. And finally, last but not least, Executive Director Christine McCarthy, who will serve as the moderator for tonight's discussion, joined the Provincetown Art Association and Museum in 2001. She is responsible for, for all artistic, administrative, fiscal, and strategic directions of the largest presenter of Cape Cod art by national, regional, and international artists. PAM programs include art exhibitions, educational initiatives for children and adults, publications, lectures, and performances. Through her leadership, PAM completed a $5 million um, renovation and expansion project in 2006, was awarded Silver Lead certification as the first green art museum in the US, and received museum accreditation in 2009 by the American Alliance of Museums. In 2014, Chris spearheaded the 100th anniversary celebrations of PAM, including the acquisition of 100 notable collection artworks and the creation of a new collection catalog. Please help me welcome this wonderful group. Thank you, Lynn, and thanks everybody for being here. And I just want to echo uh, the thanks to John and Tony who continue to underwrite this amazing um, lecture series. We've had some incredible speakers here and we're hoping to continue to do so um, so that we can document the legacy of the oldest continuous art colony in America in what, in fact, what Ray and, and Norma have done in this exhibition. Um, what we're gonna do is focus a little bit on the, the photo the photography and the art as a message. Why are these people important? Why are they here? Why are we documenting them? Why is it so important that this continue to happen? A little bit about the curatorial process because as you can see, this is a limited space and based on what Lynn told you, there were hundreds and hundreds of pictures to choose from. Narrowing it down to what they chose was no easy feat and I want to thank Ethan and Jane for that because that is not, that is highly difficult especially when you're dealing with living artists as well. Sorry, living artists, you're all wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but to make those choices was very, very difficult, and I want them to talk a little bit about the process. And Ray's images, his art is, is photography, it's painting, it's collage, it's mixed media, to talk a little bit about his process as well, and taking a photograph which Today, especially with social media, Instagram, Facebook, all you do is see pictures. You see pictures, you're bombarded with pictures. Why are these pictures important in the grand scheme of Provincetown? What is the difference between documentary photography and fine art photography, portraiture, etc.? So my first question to the panel is, the power of an image is the power of its message. What is our message? Ethan, you can start. <laughs> <laughs> um, they didn't get the questions in yeah. advance. You see. Power, yeah, exactly. It's sort of the power of the message. Um, I would say that it's so exciting as a curator to look at uh, two artists' uh, artistic process and how they viewed the community, the people in the community, how they approached uh, using the camera, how they approached using the camera and then printing out and then dealing with the surface. And I think that um, Norma, her photography um, is so sensitive and personal and she was able to get into the studios and also open, so many people opened their lives to her. I think that nude the new, some of the nude photos actually of Norma's, um, but each one is very 
special and has Norma's DNA on it. And I think that the Zimilis' um, work in the back, uh, if you look at the um, actual contact sheet, it's so special. Um, I've been in art for now over 30 years and I thought, for me, my personal, I just love the t contact sheets when Jane was sharing them with me that um, Chris was so generous to open those images to us and we spent an entire day looking through all of Norma's negatives and or what we had and seeing how Norma was open to experiment for experimentation and even maybe accident and she created something so beautiful in that contact sheet that you should really take a look at it because I think for me my history of collecting and appreciating art it's really it's such a privilege to have seen all these but specifically that one I really like but the power of the message I think that Ray's work I've always found fascinating I've watched it from day one uh, when he when Ray started using photography and documenting our friends in this community and um, maybe some of these people have passed but they are here alive and their legacy is going to go on for years and years to come so that's one of the great powers and the beauty of being an artist that your legacy your works go on so I think that that's also very special I think uh, Jack Kahn and Palmer still alive right there fantastic you know and I think that um, for me as a curator and having grown up in this community and being an art professional showing these images the power of the image and I think that it shows the diverse um, uh, types of artistic processes that people worked on from sculpture and painting, photography, objects, uh, writers, um, their distractions on the, on the beach even though I think that Ray and Norma caught them like playing poker, playing backgammon, um, it, it, showing these people as really human beings. I think that that's the dignity of each of these individuals. I think that's maybe the power of the image maybe for me. Um, I think that both Norma Holt and Ray um, captured the spirit of the whole Outer Cape colony. So for me, it's the whole spirit of Provincetown and Outer Cape. And what you see here is a range of people, all walks of life, both the uh, all walks of the different artists in town. Um, but they also include the artists like down the end is a, a photograph of Anthony Sousa who was a violin maker in town. Um, then we have Ion Walker who was a gallery owner. Um, you have Sebastian Junger, the writer. So it, it, for me it captures the spirit, the whole spirit of Provincetown and all the people that are living today are breathing through our past. And this is the spirit of our past and present. Um, I, I arrived here in 1970 when I was 25 years old and I didn't know a single person and within a few years I felt like I knew everybody and it was partially because this community is so much more welcoming uh, especially to artists than any other community I've participated in and uh, Chris Boos is here and in, in, in 1985 we co-founded Provincetown Arts um, and when I shifted to making these paintings, Chris said, oh, you're just, keep, you're just doing the same thing that we did with Provincetown Arts, except you've shifted to a different medium, and you're documenting the life of this colony through these, through these portraits. And for me, part of the question was, I'd seen a lot of uh, portraits, for example, Arnold Newman's portraits and Jane's portraits. I'm in her first book that she did in the 70s. Um, and, and a lot of those are shot in the studio showing the artist at work or, or you know, doing something of that nature. And I wanted to approach it from a different perspective, which was why do people come back here year after year? What's the, I, I wanted to, dab, uh, to document the fabric of life, the things that people do here besides work uh, that makes them want to come back. So, uh, you know, Sebastian Younger, is a surfer, and I, as far and as I know, he still is a surfer. surfer. And I'm a surfer. I, when he was a teenager, I'm sure I was out in the water with him. Uh, I, I just didn't know who he was, and nobody else did either. Uh, and and um, you know, the Murray Zimmelies, uh, I met because when I was living in New York, he partnered with a guy named Michael Kanegan, and, and they did. They were 
uh, master printers and they did prints for some of the, the, the top artists of the time in the 60s and the 70s and I bump into him in Provincetown when I come out there and then I find that all these people have legacies connecting, connecting to one another so uh, Murray's uncle was Boris Margo which is why he was here and uh, that image right there is standing next to his uncle's dune shack. Uh, so there's so many interconnecting things and one other thing I'll, I'll add to it uh, when, the, when we started Provincetown Arts, the first few issues were uh, tabloids and not perfect bound magazines. And I, I, I think a lot of people here remember B.H. Friedman, uh, Bob Friedman, the writer. And he had just moved. Uh, Bob owned what was Joseph Hirshhorn's house, and he later, it later became Norman Mailer's house. And um, Bob had moved from, Bob and Abby had moved from here to the Hamptons. So we asked him to write a piece comparing the Hamptons and Provincetown. And one of his lines in there that I quote all the time, and Chris, you can correct me if I get this wrong, uh, is that in Provincetown there's sidewalk vi vitality and constant, and when the tide is out, there's constant traffic on the flats. In the Hamptons, everything happens behind tall hedges. So uh, I think that's part of what happens here. And one of the things I'm finding, like right now, um, uh, we moved to Miami Beach area uh, a few years ago after being here for 43 years. And just walking down the street, it's like, my life keeps coming down the street at me and I keep running into people that I've known like Dan Richter since uh, you know since the early 70s and so this is such a wonderful place because of that continuity and that's what I'm trying to capture in this Ooh, great. series. You know in that continuity there's Boris Margo. Norm Holt's right. photograph of Boris Margo yeah. related to Murray and Martha. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the really beautiful things about the show is that you both you and Norma photograph the same people and we know that there are probably lots of other photographers or artists that have depicted these same people so let's talk a little bit about the choices so for Jane and Ethan first talk about how you chose the works for the exhibition and then Ray I'm gonna ask you how you choose the people you choose to actually create the works of art so you guys can start with that talk a little bit about your process on this because it wasn't easy yeah, it all. wasn't easy. Yeah. So there were Because I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so we, we have, well, for Ray's work, we looked at all of Ray's photographs on his website because they're pretty much they're there, correct, right? So we a went, lot of them. a lot of them are there. Mm -hmm. um, plus we had a PowerPoint presentation that Ray had sent us with suggestions. Um. <laughs> Actually, I went down to uh, Miami during Art Basel uh, to meet with Ray and interview Ray and look at his work. And I've seen Ray's work for, well, since 1989, really growing up with it and in the process and uh, having been having a conversation. So when Ray had suggested, um, well, we were talking with Brian Dunnigan and talking with Chris McCarthy and um, and then when Jane and I started to get together we sort of thought about how how do you tackle this because there's so many images and the space is so limited I mean beautiful space but we didn't want to um, jam it with so many images we wanted to enliven the space we wanted to make a dynamic in this space and what's so beautiful is that uh, Ray created uh, a PowerPoint that is over in the corner behind you all that you can see which really opens up to all his work and Norma's work, which is really wonderful, so that it includes... Uh, <laughs> that's right. But you were turning slightly, so it was, it was still okay, <laughs> decent. Um, so we apologize in the sense that we could include everybody. Um, we actually, the real aesthetic uh, choices that we had to make, we were trying to um, figure out works that we that spoke to both of us yes. and we tried to uh, do it independently not involving too much Ray but Ray let us you know and same with Norma I mean I think that we were trying to be fair we wanted to uh, have a balance we wanted both Ray and Norma to have a conversation visual conversation we wanted even though uh, Ray's works are larger um, we wanted to show 
enormous works in a very uh, professional way. So uh, Jane blew them up slightly, a little bit larger. And when we, when I came across the uh, transparencies or the contact sheets, I was so um, fascinated because I myself am a photographer, and I thought that you or everyone would be so interested in seeing those. So I said to Jane, "Why don't we put those on the wall so that everyone else could discover Norma's work too, and seeing how Norma chose which photographs? Maybe Norma." There were other works that were also interesting, and then Ray, we thought maybe Ray would do a contact sheets, but um, because of space limitation, it turned into the PowerPoint and we included Norma. So um, we also were limited by the size of the room, and this wall comes out, but we wanted to, um, we didn't want to lose that wall if we, if we put it away, so that the idea of suspending works, creating your own wall, and then also to the outside of the, I love this glass window, that's one of my favorite rooms of this museum, so that the outside as people pass this, this space, you can interact with the exhibition 24 seven, which is neat. And so at night it's fun to walk it by, yes, and really then you're cool. sort of curious what's in the museum. And so that was sort of behind. Yeah, and in the daytime you can come in and wander in and out of the photos. Yes. So you interact with them close up, you know. Be real close with Lee here. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, actually, uh, we, Jane, we were going to have six layers of uh, uh, smaller photographs of Norma's here, but it was a little too crowded. Yeah. And so um, Jane made that smart decision to limit it to these numbers here so that you had enough room to discover. And I would encourage you, if you haven't uh, walked, when there are not a lot of people in this room, circulate around the room and look at all the works from different angles. And I think one of the most delicious um, uh, works in this exhibition I, uh, is with a combination of Samantha Treef and uh, uh, Bob Henry. Um, if you go around the corner, you'll see Bob Henry's portrait by Ray, and I had never seen it so close. But because of the proximity of, of you with the viewer and the work, you get this dynamic that Bob Henry is really there. And I, I, I experienced this with Bob the other night, and he, Bob said, yeah, it's a really nice painting. I wish I had painted it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so it's fun. Discover this exhibition because um, you can, it's fun. It's, it, it's and you start seeing different relationships between um, all the work here. So if you look at it from that corner, it's different than if you look at it from that corner. Um, so moving around the space really gives you a different perspective on the photos and how they relate to one another and how the people really occupy this space in this room. And, and another interesting thing is that the Norma Holtz the ones that were chosen from the contact sheets are not necessarily the ones that are in the book either. Yes. So there were different people selecting the finals for the books as opposed to the exhibition. But the idea that you can see the other options is just brings it more to life to, to see how, how many shots she did take of, of all these different people. So it really encompasses a, a huge amount of work, but placed so beautifully that you don't feel like it's overcrowded at all, which thank you for doing that. <laughs> and Ray was doing very interesting with he was comparing how many actual uh, individuals he photographed and Norma photographed the exact same people and we right, were trying to right. put them together and so we're producing now a actual book catalog for this exhibition which will be another a venue of experiencing visual um, imagery mm -hmm. um, and of Norma and uh, Ray coming together so that's going to be very exciting and we hope that'll be out in two weeks. Great. Yeah. That's great. And, and what's interesting about that is it, it, the, one of the ways the dynamic changes is because we're dealing with a uh, I don't know what it is eight by something uh, book um, the images are the same size so instead of mine being five by six feet uh, you know they're eight by okay. ten inches yeah. and the same with Norma so they're that's good. That's interesting. Interesting. Well, interesting. One of the things that's um, coming to the forefront in this exhibition that we should, I was, I'm, I'm thinking about and I, and I share with you all, is the idea of the pixel or digitization. And one of the things that I found fascinating as a, um, I'm a 55 year old, you know, art professional, curator, art dealer, collector, um, watching Ray's work and seeing his work evolve from really low tech printing where you were collaging onto a canvas and then painting into it. Sometimes a lot of paint into it, sometimes less paint. Um, I think that um, 
the Joyce Johnson portrait has paint in it. The Zimlis portrait has maybe more paint. You, I think there's a lot of paint in the, um, the Joyce Johnson, but it's, I feel it's very photographic. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, the Yucca portrait or the portrait of your son on the other side here with the shaving cream has so much paint in it. it was, it's fascinating to see how you used photography and mixed it into your painting. And I think, um, and as we understand pixels and what's, what is a pixel, and I, have a I actually have an uh, exhibition in my gallery uh, of a young graduate from Hunter who has invented the term post-analog pointillism, um, and, uh, which is fun because when you look at the Doug Hubler work, there is a little bit more, I'd say, it's not as sharp, it's a little more pixel, has that quality, uh, painterly feeling, and then the Norma photographs in the corner, much more intense, you almost say, and when you look at the context, you have to take a magnifying glass, maybe even look at it, but, so very dense pixels. So I think that's sort of interesting, and I think um, how we are all now photographers, we're with our iPhones, you know, um, and uh, so it's really fascinating, you know, that really, uh, one of the really things that really caught me was, oh, this is something that I'm growing, I've been growing up with, and it's still in the process of, and we're all in the process of, and what a wonderful way to focus on this Outer Cape community. So that's sort of, uh, it's an interesting conversation developing. So yeah. why don't you talk a little bit about your process, Ray, not only selecting your, your, the, the, the subjects of your works, but a little bit more about your process and how you actually create these. Okay, well, let, let me start with the selection yeah. and then, and then yeah. the process. Um, w w in the late 60s, I hung up with Baba Ramdas in New York and up on his father's farm in New Hampshire. So when I came up here in the 70s, um, uh, I had a carton full of Baba Ramdas tapes that I used to play for some of my friends and they all thought I was a woo-woo lunatic. And, and, but I was really into uh, um, uh, uh, Buddhism and, and when I first came up here. And so I had read Gurdjieff's Meetings with Remarkable Men, which is uh, partially about the, the, the road to enlightenment and the people you meet along the way that influence and inspire you. So I translated that after becoming a hedonist in Provincetown. I translated <laughs> that to, um, to this body of work. and. Uh, so the first piece that I did was the piece of Jack and Palmer, Jack Conn and Palmer Williams, and I love the both these guys dearly. And um, and uh, Jack had um, uh, several sons. The the oldest two were best men in uh, Lee and I's wedding. And we, we because we had two of them, we called them two decent guys instead of a best man. Um, and I was best man in Terry's wedding, so we were really close to the family, and that felt. Um, w when I started doing this, they, the portraits felt more autobiographical because they were also about my life in this community and how I interact with the people in the community. Um, and so in the case of Jack and Palmer, at some point in my life they actually let me play backgammon with them. And so I used to do that as frequently as I could. And, and similarly with a, lot, with a lot of these people, they were not just prominent people in this community, but they were also uh, you know, m my best friends. So, so that was part of the selection process. And then, uh, you know, you run out of best friends after a while. So, um, <laughs> so then you start looking around and you say, well, who is having an impact here? And uh, who are people that, uh, that are important to document? And uh, so I, you know, for example, with Bob Rindler, I, I did a portrait of him, but, you know, we, we didn't know each other that well. We, we had started to get to know each other. And, and so that's an example of somebody who's having uh, an impact on this community in many ways. And, and I felt important to be part of the process. So the process itself, when, when, um, when Ethan said that uh, it started off low tech, uh, when I actually invented this process, it was because I thought I was going to give up painting. And I'd read, our son was born in 1989, and it was a choice between Provincetown Arts and, 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 and uh, giving up painting. And 
Um, so I did this series I called Death of a Muse, and it was tombstones in ancient burial grounds in, in, in um, Boston area with, uh, you know, crossbones and skulls on them. And I started photographing those, and I had such little control over what I was doing uh, because it was all new and I didn't really know what I was doing, but, but the outcome uh, was pretty good. And somebody uh, at Swansboro Gallery gave me a show of the work, and I got a lot of positive feedback on it. Um, and in the beginning, uh, digital cameras weren't uh, practical yet. So I was literally printing six by four inch prints at, at, you know, uh, through Kodak or whoever, but not in any kind of major photographer kind of way where you go out and have some lab and, and then spend a lot of money on the prints. It was just send them out and get them back. And, and, but I did have access to a $40,000 uh, Canon CLC 500 color copier, which was brand new. And it turned out that built into that machine was um, a function that enabled you to enlarge an image to any size you wanted, and it would automatically tile it so the paper overlapped. 11, and I was using 11 by 17 archival paper. And the image was continuous tone printing, so it, didn't, it never pixelated. You know, it might be a little blurry, but it never pixelated. So, for, so if you look at, uh, you know, Jack and Palmer, or you look at Doug Hubler, which are amongst the first ones, um, you know, there's no pixelation in it. And the other thing um, that I liked about it was it didn't look, uh, when, when you got closer to it, it didn't really look like a sharp photograph. It looked more painterly. And, and, um, and I wanted to keep that quality. And ironically, as the technology got better, I kept on trying to degrade it so that it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't look like a sharp photo. Um, so that is kind of, you know, the funny, funny part is that the better it gets, the worse I try to make it. Um, <laughs> And, oh, and then the rest of the process is, so I printed out on, say, uh, uh, one of these pieces that's 60 by 43 inches. I might print out 20 pieces of paper. I soak them in water. I adhere them to a canvas with a polymer medium, a plastic medium. So they're literally saturated in plastic. And they're kind of impervious. I mean, I've treated these pretty roughly. They don't even scratch unless you really work at it. Um, and, and the other interesting thing, there's a big portrait I did of Lee and I on her 40th birthday, right? And it, it was a five by six foot painting uh, that hung in direct sunlight in our house for 20 years <laughs> and it barely faded. Uh, so this process was pretty interesting from that standpoint. When the National Portrait Gallery took in my first piece, they were terrified that everything was going to fade. So they, you know, put special glass on it. They, they put the canvases under glass. Um, and then the, the rest of the process is, and then I use oil paint and paint on top of that, depending on what I want to accomplish. And Jane, you had the, the privilege of knowing Norma. What can you tell us about her pro selection process or her photographic process? Because clearly these are way more than just a snapshot of people. They are absolutely elegant. The composition of these photographs is, is just spot on. Talk a little bit about that for us. You know, and I think she really did capture um, who the people were. Um, and she knew most of the people, not everybody. Um, she had a 35 millimeter camera. Uh, she got a grant, a CETA grant, in order to do these photos. Um, one of her favorite photos is the photo behind in the window of Lena Gur naked, sipping um, tea. Mm. So that was Norma's favorite photo. Um, and when Norma went to photograph Lena, what Norma said was, gee, maybe I could photograph you in your underwear, trying to get something different. Because she was always trying to pose people differently, to get a different angle, to really capture the spirit of the people. And what Lena Gur said to her was, no, no, no. If I'm naked, then it's art. Otherwise, it's pornography if it's on. <laughs> <laughs> so Lena actually was the one in that case who volunteered to be naked holding her, uh, holding her coffee cup. Um, Norma photographed Robert Motherwell uh, in his studio, studio as well as portraits of him and she